Karen McInerney from Crokey here and I'm talking to Dr. Simon Judkins at the Choosing Wisely uh, annual meeting here to mark the two year anniversary of the initiative here. What um, could you just uh, talk about your the, the hats you're wearing here and then um, what you see as the significance of Choosing Wisely? So I'm really here I suppose wearing two hats. There's one is that the uh, the chair of the Austin um, Hospital Choosing Wisely uh, committee and we're doing a lot of work in that, that public hospital sphere about implementing not only um, some of the college Choosing Wisely recommendations but also developing our own recommendations and really looking at how we educate um, our um, staff uh, both medical, nursing and allied health about appropriate investigation, appropriate test ordering and appropriate treatments for our patients. I'm also wearing a hat from um, as the, uh, as the uh, Australasian College for Emergency Medicine so we've been involved quite heavily in the Choosing Wisely campaign right from the get-go and emergency medicine is really sort of front and centre in, in a lot of the Choosing Wisely implement, um, implementations and, and initiatives. And you're very heartened by the Choosing Wisely approach. Yeah, I, I certainly think it's a step in the right direction. Um, I think the ethos of Choosing Wisely is really about bringing doctors or clinicians, any clinician, and patients together to make shared decisions about what is appropriate care for them. Um, you know, I think the paradigm in Australia has swung very much towards over-investigation, test ordering, um, a lot of unnecessary treatments, and I suppose over... Um, uh, too many uh, interventions I suppose we're very intervention um, reliant and I think we need to rebalance that and look a lot more towards prevention of disease in the first place and sometimes doing nothing is the right choice you know um, and we've seen multiple examples here of people talking about things for example for knee arthroscopies is, is one classic example where you know um, the choice between doing something and doing nothing sometimes the best choice is doing nothing and just watching waiting and seeing did you want to raise a couple of examples of what you're doing in Austin, including you talked about yesterday there being quite an interesting end of life discussion there? Yeah, so we've take, we've had a bit of a multi-pronged approach at Austin and looked at some of the basic, what they've called here the low-hanging fruit, I suppose, and that's about pathology ordering, um, reducing radiology ordering and those sorts of issues. But one of our um, ongoing um, uh, projects has really, really been about end of life care and, and we know um, not only in Austin Health but multiple uh, different organisations that we don't really uh, approach end of life care um, as well as we should and could and there seems to be a significant uh, difference between what patients want and what the health system actually delivers. So we had an end of life care forum at Austin Health where we invited doctors and consumers and patients into the same room and we had a very open and robust conversation about where those differences are and how we um, can do a lot better uh, working together to fill that space. You suggested that what was uh, what stood out about that was the timing of it. It wasn't during patient acute. Yeah, I think I think this is one of the things. I think you know, um, doctors and patients are always talking together when somebody is acutely unwell, where there's a need, where we need something fixed. We don't actually have the opportunity to sit together in, in different forums or in different spaces outside of an, where there's an acute medical question and really start to tease apart what those, those issues are. And it was really quite interesting and I think we, we everybody in that room learned a, a hell of a lot. Could you think of a takeaway from it? Um, a takeaway is that I think we need to demedicalise and de-hospitalise end of life care and I think you know doctors need to learn from patients and patients need to learn from doctors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know it's a complex thing and this whole idea I think of, I mean, one of the interesting things for me is that this whole idea of patients dying at home you know again it, it's it's easily said but there was a lot of complexity about even doing that as well so you know I think we've got a long way to go again to um, one demystify death and what death is all about um, and how death happens but also as I said demedicalize it because um, death as we know is a natural process it's not a it's not a medical process um, and, and it doesn't require medical intervention but it might require medical support um, and so we have to be less interventional and more supportive. When, uh, during the panel discussion you were involved in you, you were asked to sort of consider 
how to take the whole Choosing Wisely initiative further and I guess yep. that's a question about moving beyond the low hanging fruit. You, is that the context with which you talked about the role of medical students in this? Yeah, I think I think some of these sorts of change, as we know, any, changing any system is an enormous job, and we can't just change it overnight by saying, "Oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to stop doing this or we're going to start doing this." Um, and I think one of the things is really, it's taken us many, many years to evolve the medical system to where it is now, where we're recognising that we need to turn this ship around. So it's going to take very much, you know, we keep on using the term cultural change, but you know, cultural change or generational change, we need to educate and um, our new clinicians, doctors, nurses, physios, allied health, about um, how um, to change the direction that medical care is going. And I think, and, and you talk to, if you listen to what patients want, they want conversations, they want doctors to listen, um, they don't necessarily want tests. And this is a really fascinating stuff that's come out of here. We're assuming that patients want tests, they, but a lot of them don't come to hospital to have tests, they come to hospital because they want somebody to listen to them um, and, uh, and allay some of their fears and answer some of their questions. Um, and we don't necessarily answer a lot of their questions by doing anything. Um, but do you think with medical students it needs to be in the curriculum? Oh, certainly, and I think that's come up in a number of different um, uh, presentations today, is that the whole concept of, um, you know, one of the terms that we've been using here is about resource stewardship. Um, and I think everybody needs to realise that we are responsible for the, uh, you know, the long-term functionality, the effectiveness and the sustainability of our healthcare system. Because, you know, we've got a fantastic healthcare system, there's no doubt about that. But we all need to be mindful that it's, with interventions, it is becoming more expensive. Uh, people are living longer, um, you know, so we need to ensure that we are able to continue with a healthcare system that is one of the best in the world, but also that we're not leaving people behind. And it was interesting, one of the conversations about, you know, if we do save money by being less interventional, where would we like to see that reinvestment? And, and, and a lot of the comments are around um, prevention, so providing dental services to people, um, you know, vaccination programs, those sorts of things. So, you know, choosing wisely is also about um, the concept is about where we invest our healthcare dollar. And there's no doubt that, um, for example, prevention of illness is probably a much wiser uh, investment um, and much cheaper investment than actually intervening at the end. The, there's a lot of talk about choosing wisely as it not as it not being a financial imperative, and yet today we've heard a lot about cost savings and the cost burden in health. Is there a worry for you? You've got a big public health focus. Yeah. Do you um, worry that that will take over the? Look, it's, there's no doubt it's part of the mix, and I don't think that. And I, I think one of the I suppose one of the the drivers, or no, not the driver, but we all know that healthcare is expensive, and we all know that. Um, that uh, waste or unnecessary tests is expensive and so there's no doubt that cost saving or resource better resource allocation would be part of this conversation but it's not the driver you know we're talking about things that interventions that may actually lead to harm to people as well um, and we heard an example of you know, uh, it was Brendan Murphy telling us about his recurrent um, knee arthroscopies, mm -hmm. which probably advanced his, progressed his arthritis actually than, than fixed it. But we also hear examples of um, interventions that, in retrospect, weren't needed that actually develop complications. Because you have to remember, every time we prescribe a drug, every time we do a test, every time we do an in intervention, with that carries a risk. Mm -hmm. So we can reduce, reduce the risk by doing um, less. Uh, and doing more appropriate interventions. Are you actually though cataloguing the uh, cost savings at Austin? Is that a big part of it? Are you t trying to build an economic analysis about it, around it all? Uh, we have, but it hasn't been a driver. Mm -hmm. You know, when people ask me how much money have you saved, I don't know, I can't pluck that figure off the top of my head because it really hasn't been important. It's not, I know it's there, mm -hmm. and I know that money is going to be reinvested somewhere, um, but it's really not the driver. The driver for me, and the thing that really interests me, and ex I suppose excites me, that the thing where we know we're successful is seeing our investigations decreasing and knowing that patients are still getting a great level of care. Um, and we know that we know that um, you know by not ordering certain blood tests or or making sure that we collect the appropriate urine sample or we're not doing blood cultures that it's not impacting ongoing patient care. So that's that's the main driver. I mean, we need to make sure that we don't get 
overzealous about this and, and so there will be a balance along the way that we've you know there will be occasions where people will need a certain test so we want to make sure there still is that scope for you know those tests to be done when it's appropriate uh, can you stop hospital administrators from being overzealous in health departments like um, you know, um, uh, the chief medical officer did talk about changing the the narrative and the culture for, for clinicians around this yeah no it was interesting it was an interesting point wasn't it because we did speak about do you legislate is there legislative changes that need to put in place i would hope that we don't need that because i think again i think that's what we've failed in the past to change culture because people have said you have to do this because i think what we need is that people involved in healthcare realize they have to do this because it's the right thing to do and i think as soon as you actually put those other you know, it's, it's the carrot and stick approach. Mm. I think we need to give people a carrot and say, this is good for the healthcare system, we know it's good, it's good for your patients, um, and we don't want to you know, have to hit them over here with a stick, because then you'll never get the change. Thank you very much. It's time for you to get some lunch at the MCG.